National Independent Automobile, Automobile, Automobile Dealers Association. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, it is my pleasure to offer our testimony on behalf of myself in my capacity as general counsel to the National Independent Auto Dealers Association here today. My career in the motor vehicle industry has spanned the last 25 years, while NIADA has represented independent, non-franchised motor vehicle dealers for over 60 years. The NIADA and its state affiliate associations represent more than 20,000 dealers located across the United States. We recognize how vitally important the motor vehicle industry is and the impact the used motor vehicle segment of the industry has on our economy. There are currently about 249 million motor vehicles on the road, the median age of which is approximately eight and a half years. There are approximately 40 million retail used motor vehicle transactions per year, roughly split between franchise dealers, independent dealers, and private individuals. Used motor vehicles, because of what they are, carry a history of use and condition. During the process of trade among these vehicles, consumers and dealers alike need access to accurate, timely information about the history and condition of the vehicles. This information affects how much either will pay for the vehicle. This is particularly important to consumers because outside of housing, it often represents the largest single purchase that they will make. In a dealer's case, his ability to pass on timely and accurate information to a consumer means the difference between developing a consumer that will refer new business to him and having a consumer full of ill will who, at a minimum, drives business away from him. It should be no secret that the motor vehicle industry is one of the most heavily regulated in the country with a maze of overlapping and sometimes conflicting federal and state legislation and implementing regulations. Unfortunately, the good intentions that inspired these efforts have, in large part, created to an increase in the cost of motor vehicles and, in many instances, led to confusion on the part of the consumer and frustration for dealers. Nevertheless, tens of thousands of businesses have developed practices and procedures that allow them to carry on commerce within the confines of those restrictions. Therefore, we do not advocate comprehensive overnight change in this area but gradual change is needed for the benefit of both the consumer and the dealer. I will be happy, Mr. Chairman, to work on behalf of NIADA with those responsible for making the changes, if that should be your desire. My entire professional career has focused on motor vehicles, consumer protection issues, and the motor vehicle industry as a whole. In considering my written testimony, I realized I could discuss dozens of issues affecting consumers in the used motor vehicle industry, including everything from advertising issues and car buyers' bills of rights to spot deliveries and the finance and insurance process as a whole, all of which would have merit. However, I elected to comment upon four issues that are currently at the forefront of the motor vehicle industry at the national level. Warranties, including what they are and how they're created and disclosed. The FTC use car rule, including the content of the form itself and complications that arise from its completion. Financing of motor vehicle transactions and the tax treatment of a buy here, pay here transaction. Touching on this last issue, in these uncertain economic times, it has become increasingly difficult for capital to flow from lenders to credit impaired consumers for the purchase of a used motor vehicle. A person's credit can become impaired for various reasons, often as a result of some event over which they have no control, such as loss of a job, health-related issues, or other family circumstances. Likewise, new families just starting out may not have established credit and may have difficulty obtaining financing. For all of these people, a car is not a luxury, but a necessity. Because of these considerations, I'm suggesting that a mechanism needs to be implemented as soon as possible to incentivize sales of used motor vehicles. An easy and inexpensive way to accomplish this is to permit used motor vehicle dealers, like similarly sized businesses, to utilize a modified cash or installment sale method of accounting for transactions with the dealer's finance for their customers. Permitting such modification would provide customers with impaired credit or no credit access to additional financing sources for their used motor vehicle purchases. While preparing for this hearing, I could not help reflect on instances where, at least at first impression, cooperative resolution of competing issues might not have seemed possible. Working with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration on the implementation of the Anti-Car Theft Act of 1992, with representatives of the IRS to develop an audit technique guide for the used motor vehicle industry, 
and with representatives of the FTC in interpreting the FTC used car rule and publication of a dealer's guide to the rule come to mind. In each circumstance, work by dedicated people with differing points of view yielded an effective result. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to participate here today and will answer any questions later as time permits. Thank you. Mr. Juan, in your testimony, you expressed some concerns about including Nevada's information in the buyer's guard, uh, arguing that dealers could be liable for gaps in the Nevada's database. Would you, uh, first of all, is that correct? And would you please explain it more? Yes, Mr. Chairman. The <clears throat> I think everyone can agree that a car that's been damaged and been repaired improperly is unsafe and shouldn't be on the road. And cars that have been <clears throat> in a flood uh, or had saltwater damage, that's the most insidious. The problem isn't necessarily with the disclosure of the information, but the problems it causes. If Nimvitas was a database that was comprehensive and everyone had access to it, dealers would be happy to pass on the information that's available to them. The unfortunate reality is, is this database is being updated on, a, on an ongoing basis. So when a dealer takes a car in on trade or purchases one and completes the FTC sticker, that information might be accurate at that time and the very next day may be inaccurate. We also have concern that consumers would rely too heavily at this point on information <clears throat> that is not going to be complete. And therefore, if a statement posted on the motor vehicle is there, it's going to be considered an advertisement under the state's Unfair and Deceptive Practices Act, and the dealers are going to be liable for the untruthfulness of the report that they can't control. I think Nimbitis is a very useful tool, and I think there will come a day when there will be access and we can talk about that type of disclosure. We just don't think we're here yet. Thank you very much. That concludes my, um, my time is up, rather. Mr. Is it Wan? Juan. Mr. Juan, I have a couple of questions. What cost do, do you or the manufacturer bear for compliance due to state and federal laws? And, and uh, does the consumer bear these costs in, in the sale price of the vehicle? Well, I think any costs, obviously, that uh, relate to compliance with those type of issues at some point are going to be rolled into the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. So there are some costs, such as title and filing fees and some of those type of things, that are directly passed on to the consumer. <clears throat> when we talk about things like documentary fees, most of those are established by state law except those that don't have caps, and therefore that is like any other charge that could be levied. Um, that's a vote call. You can choose to you can talk through it. Okay, thank you. It goes on all the time. So th those, um, those charges are not passed on, but I will tell you the with the amount of regulation that's been placed upon car dealers in particular, um, graham leach Bliley Act, mm -hmm. the Safeguards Rule, be disposal information. <laughs> I'm sorry to get this down. Uh, the Red Flags Rule, the cost of compliance today is, is immeasurable. You couldn't go and put a dollar amount on it. Uh, cost of compliance is cost of doing business, and it is not directly passed on to the consumer. But realistically speaking, it is included in the cost of doing business. Uh -huh. Can you give me, too, a sense of how much the consumer pays in state and local taxes and fees in the average pur purchase of a car? Can you give me a ballpark figure? It varies across the country. I know that uh, in some states, documentary fees are less than $100. In probably the vast majority, if you looked at an average, it may be in the $250 range. There are some that don't cap them, and you know we've heard some research or testimony today that could run as high as four to $700. I don't have any research to suggest that. Um, you know, Taxes, obviously, the sales taxes on the car, and then title and filing fees are usually I'll say nominal in the terms of thousands, but when you're buying a car, every 10 or $20 bill in there, if you can't afford to buy the car, uh, obviously is significant. That's a, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Wan. And again, for uh, Mr. Wan, if, uh, if I might, on the, on the issue of uh, <clears throat> cram down or court forced um, uh, lowering of loan principles, if that were to come into effect in the auto industry um, with the, the people that you represent, uh, the auto dealers and those, <clears throat> wanting to sell cars and, and you, you, nine times out of ten you got to arrange financing for the people that are buying the cars. If cram down were, effect, uh, were in effect on the, in the automobile industry, would that, 
how, what kind of effect might it have on your auto dealers? And if you've got an opinion on the, on the banks that, that provide auto loans as well uh, for the consumer. Well, speaking on behalf of the, the auto dealers, you're going to take something um, essentially a receivable that they're going to collect and it's going to be worth much less stretched out over time and the interest rate adjusted. Given that this primarily affects not the average used car dealer but somebody in the buy here, pay here industry, that would probably upset their business model and, uh, and likely put them out of business. Mm -hmm. Now, hopefully, when they're engaging in these types of loans, uh, you hope the portfolio is good. It's your own money that's in the street. And based upon the research I've seen in the buy here, pay here industry, the average consumer puts down roughly $1,000. And the average cash in deal for the dealer is somewhere between $4,000 and $4,500. Mm -hmm. So if, in fact, the dealer who's already paying tax on the income before they receive it, so the dealer essentially has an interest-free loan to nobody, they're going to pay tax on the income, and then if, in fact, somebody, for whatever reason, winds up in bankruptcy through no fault of their own or not, and the loan is crammed down, that dealer is going to be squeezed on both ends. Both ends. Yes. Yeah. Do you think that, uh, uh, in your opinion, do you think uh, banks would be less or more likely to lend if, if court-ordered cram down was in effect in that industry? I would say that they're probably less likely, but I, but I will tell you, based upon a lot of the testimony I hear today, I obviously am experiencing something different than maybe some of the other people who are testifying. Mm -hmm. Because in, <clears throat> in the industry that we have with the independent dealer, we're having trouble getting lenders. So our biggest challenge right now is having lenders who will finance a transaction. Mm -hmm. We don't have finance reserve that's going to be eight points or five points. I mean, if there is finance reserve, it's a point and a half or two. Mm -hmm. um, we feel very strongly that service contracts are something of value at a fair price because the consumer doesn't have the money to be able to, to pay for the car if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. A gap product may be there. But beyond that, we don't have anything to sell to the consumer. You've got the front end of the deal the profit from the car sale, you've got the back end from the finance and insurance process. Our biggest challenge is getting banks that want to do business. Not to work so hard to have a customer come in and get them financed and have them leave to bring them back for some sort of false circumstances. That's not my experience. I see, I understand. Thank you very much. I yield Thank back, you. Mr. Chairman. Just to start off, the question is for Mr. Birch, uh, Wand, and Waldron. Uh, Maybe just a commentary on Navitas. Um, as I understand, Navitas, which was enacted or created in 1992 as an anti-car theft act, uh, right now um, it does not specifically track damaged vehicles that have had airbags deployed. Um, and I th as I understand, it does not cover individuals or self-insured owners uh, that are required to provide information Navitas. And I guess the question is, uh, in the overall scheme of things, um, title washing and other acts of fraud, uh, is there a better way than doing it perhaps uh, through NHTSA than Navitas? This might just be a general question. Unfortunately, we face many of the same issues today that we faced back when the Anti-Car Theft Act was enacted. Um, I think back to uh, when Dick Morse convened the advisory group after the passage of that and uh, when myself and Gary Dickinson did an educational session for them on titling and title washing. And we have the same problem then that we have today. We well, have, here we are 17 years later and we're still talking about it. Exactly. We still have, we're not, I think it's probably safe to assume we're not going to have a national title. So if we're not going to have a national title because we have 50 different ways of doing this, what we have to make sure we do is that we capture title brands and that we carry them forward state to state. Yeah. Because if we don't do that, the system is only as good as the information in there. Uh, Self-insured information needs to be trapped. And of course, any safety item is critical. We can debate what's frame damage on a unibody car. But we know when an airbag has been deployed, if that could be trapped and passed on, we could make sure it's been repaired properly. 